We welcome you to the OTP, the official Titans podcast presented by your great friends at Farm Bureau Health Plans. To find out more about how Farm Bureau Health Plans can take care of you, visit their website at fbhp.com. With Amy Wells, I'm Mike Keith, joined by Rhett Bryan and Coach Dave McGinnis from Titans Radio. How is everybody? Lovely. And you? I'm, I'm lovely. No, I'm great. This is uh, this is great. I'm, I'm glad to be back with Amy again. I'm, I'm glad to be with Amy. I missed you guys. Yeah. It was very lonely here. It was quiet. There were no shenanigans. It was very just. Are you suggesting sad there are often are shenanigans? Uh, consistently, yes. yes. And so it was sad to have you guys gone, but right. I'm glad you're back. All right, so we need to get Amy's viewpoint on the game. We've, we've had yours, Coach Mack. We've had some of Rhett's. We'll get more. But because Amy was not with us in Minneapolis, where the Titans won Saturday night 24-16, to 16, Amy is going to give us five of her thoughts from the Titans' preseason game number two victory, and we will respond to them. Go right ahead. Well, in, in true form, I have about nine. Um, but <laughs> but we'll, we'll go with five unless Mike gives me time for honorable mention. I had a lot of thoughts. Um, thought number one. I loved that the offensive line had the starters play for the entire first quarter. I know that snap-wise, it was kind of equal to what they did in the first game. I think they had 12 snaps in the first preseason, preseason game, 16 snaps in the second. But I felt like there was a lot of benefit to that group of five guys going through the cadence of playing a series, coming off the field, making adjustments, playing a series, coming off the field and making adjustments. Mac, you would know better than anybody else. Is that a real thing? That's a real thing. I mean, you're, you're, you're so correct in that. And the, the biggest, one of the biggest things of this training camp was developing the offensive line. We all knew it coming in. The coaches knew it. We knew it. The players knew it. So, yes, as many snaps as they can get together, and you're 100% right. Now, the reason it evened out was the first ball game, they had an extended series, the first series they had, which culminated in a touchdown that was perfect. This time, we had a three and out. And so they were going to have to go back in there. But your point being that they were together and they needed those snaps, you're thinking correctly. And that's exactly how Mike Vrabel and his coaching staff was thinking. Second point. My second point was that conventional wisdom says that people should be worried about depth at wide receiver in the wake of some injuries at that position. And yet I am not concerned. I'm not even a little bit concerned. Do you think I'm crazy? Red? Crazy? Uh, <laughs> crazy? <laughs> now, is this because of what the finished product of right, wide receiving room will look like come September the 10th in New Orleans? Is that a part of your evaluation? That is part of my evaluation. Okay. I'm excited about some of the guys. I mean, obviously, the Nick Westbrook Akines. Obviously, there's a very big name fella also in there. Um, so, I... I I, I'm excited about the starters, but I'm also excited about some of the depth that there's still at that position that the guys that we're going to see get an opportunity to play in the wake of guys like Kyle Phillips not being in. I'm excited about like Mason Kinsey, for example. I'm excited about things that he might be able to contribute. I think that there's a lot of things to still be excited about with the group that is there beyond the DeAndre Hopkins of the world. In short term... I'm a little concerned with them getting through the the last preseason game Friday night, and I wonder if they'll add somebody or whatever for that. In the long term, I, I share your optimism that that wide receiving group is going to be pretty nice for the Titans. Point number three. Point number three. Um, I really am enjoying watching Jack Gibbons, Dr. Gibby, and I kind of – he's someone that has returned to my – radar in the last couple weeks not as much as i know that your radar he left my radar a little bit there were some other people that i was excited about and i am now fully on the dr gibby train and now he's one of my like guys to watch as the season comes up and i'm really excited about him and i think he's just going to continue to improve as the season goes on uh, I coached a guy very similar to him in Brad Castle when I was coaching here. 
those types of players, the thing that they do, they may not be the most athletic player on the field, especially at the second level, but they are so instinctive. They're such great K and D, which is key and diagnose guys. They can get ahead of blocks. They can be able to be in the right place at the right time. And the other thing that happens is, is they can get other people lined up. Now, he can make plays. He can make plays. But these types of players always are important to your roster because they're dependable. You can depend on them. He's a physical, physical player, but he's really smart. And that's, I think that's what the coaching staff likes about him. I know that as a former coach and especially a linebacker coach, you have to have guys at that second level because they tie the front and the back end together. So they have to be able to get it pretty quick. They also have to be able to get it from you on the sideline because during the course of a game, there are going to be things that change. You need somebody that can process it, can get it to the team in the huddle. All of those things make players like that extremely valuable. Rhett, I don't want to freak you out because I didn't completely forget about him, but he was always the smart player. He was like smart guy who does smart things and can help other guys, and he's reliable, he's dependable. But now he's like making plays and doing things that make he's me listed, excited. He's listed first team. Yeah. Like that's, I a, mean, that's with a big deal. Aziz Al Shire, I mean, he is listed as the first team linebacker in the unofficial depth chart. And the, uh, and we'll see, I mean, we'll see where that goes, but. I mean, I think he's put himself in a great position right now. See, it's exciting. So what you're saying is, in your defense, is that you're viewing him much like a very good offensive lineman who doesn't get the penalties called on him. Right. So well, he's he, just there. He was he consistent guy, and now he's like make you notice him guy, mm -hmm. which is two different guys. To the, me. Other, the other point about this is, I think we all will agree that our defensive front is going to be pretty special. Mm -hmm. And any time that you have a defensive front that is able to eat up and chew up what's going on up in front and get a lot of attention from the offensive line, it cleans things up for those guys at the second level. And if you have guys at the second level that can get ahead of things and can benefit from that, I mean, he's an instinctive football player. He makes plays. Mike Vrabel is not putting him on the first team in the unofficial depth chart just because he likes the person. He likes what he can do for him on the field. Point four. Point four. I guess while we're talking about defense, let's continue to talk about defense. I'm excited about the Titans secondary, and I'm not usually excited about the Titans secondary. What about the secondary are you excited about? Uh, there are lots of things. Um, I think there's depth there when in previous years we have not had a ton of depth. I think that there are guys that we have seen, the Trey Averys of the world, the, uh, that have just been showing up and making plays and showing that, hey, there, there's a lot of guys here who can make an impact, whereas before, in previous years, without the starters, you kind of went, Hmm, what's going to happen here? So I'm very excited about the secondary because I think there's a lot of playmakers on that side of the ball. I think they are hungry. I think that's a group of people that are consistently trying to make plays in a big way and are trying to uh, almost show that they are not. I mean, everybody talks about the defensive line. Everybody talks about the big guys up front on the, when they talk about the Titans defense. The little guys in the secondary aren't letting that stand. They want to make plays, too, and they're showing that they deserve to be talked about just as much as the big guys up front, and that's been really fun to watch. Well, the fact that they've cut Chris Jackson and A.J. Moore already, two guys who've been on the roster, that tells you what they think right now. Now, of course, they could bring those guys back, mm -hmm. and, and certainly guys like that will tend to come back to any NFL roster in week two when salaries are not guaranteed at that point. So that does happen. But at this point, the lane has been opened for all these young guys to, to go get jobs. And you talked, you said little guys. And then, you know, the first thing I thought was, you know, how Eric Garer has really emerged in this. The guy was brought in in, in a tryout situation, got offered an opportunity. He's making the most of that opportunity. 5'8", 174, appeared in over 60 games at Louisiana Lafayette. Dude is scared of zero, nothing. And not only that, but he adds value as a, a special teams returner uh, in this thing. I, I've really enjoyed watching him play. And a lot of these young undrafted guys uh, who, who are contributing in this preseason. But, yeah, secondary is, is something to watch for sure. 
the thing that I think has buoyed this secondary, though, is Christian Fulton came back ready to be a professional player. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That was big. And then the signing of Sean Murphy Bunning. I mean, this is a veteran player. So your two corners are, are, are pretty well set. And I'm not going to even talk about injuries. That's it. <laughs> I, I, we're not going to have any. Also, it allows you to take, take McCrary and put him in a slot because you're going to be playing a lot of altered defenses anyway this year like everybody in the National Football League does. That's p- pretty good. And the two starting safeties that we have, those are legitimate dudes that you can do a lot of things with. They're interchangeable. You can move around. So those five players to begin with off the jump, I mean, and those two corners out there, they're not little guys. Those are good-sized corners in this league. And, and to me, but when you talk about the other younger players, they have stepped up when they've gotten a chance. And not only just just occupied a spot they haven't just been out there killing grass i mean they can get involved and so i agree with it point five my final point is kind of for Rhett. my favorite player to watch right now is tajay spears he is so much fun to watch um i want to see him on the field at all times basically like in every in every facet of the game it's like we'll throw him out there see what he can do he's a fun guy to watch run around um so I I, I want more just in the final preseason game I want to see more selfishly but do you see him in the final preseason I don't game? think so but I'm to the point where I'm ready to see him play in his home native state week one September 10th in the Superdome yeah uh I'm really surprised. Of course, I know this isn't a visual medium, but I'm surprised Rhett's not wearing his Ty J. Spears shirt that he has <laughs> with Ty J. Spears' face on it yeah. that he wore to practice. Ty J. liked that, by the and way. And well, why wouldn't he? Yeah. And I always give Rhett credit because early on during the draft, when we we're vetting all these players, this was his number one guy that he really liked. And when Mike Keith announced that that was our draft pick, I mean, I thought Rhett was going to cry. He did cry a little bit. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. With tears of joy. Tears of but joy. This guy is a legitimate player legitimate player and to me to mike key's question you might have seen enough of him time for bubble wrap you might have seen (laughs) you might have seen enough of him because to me i mean he's he's shown everything on an nfl field that he showed at tulane yeah everything i i want to watch him do anything like making breakfast it's probably like I just I, I'd watch him do anything. I just think he's so much fun to watch, and when I see him on the field, I get excited. Well, you know, the thing that I find so interesting about Tajay Spears is all of these young men here who are fighting for roster spots have the drive and determination, or they wouldn't be where they are. But this guy's got a hyper drive for that. He's as hungry as anybody I've seen in a while. Um, he wants to make a better life for his parents who are working class folks and get them out of the hood, as he says. And he seems to be an infectious person. Uh, I, I'm hearing stories from Ascension St. Thomas Sports Park about how well he interacts with everyone in the building. And when you couple that with what he's doing on the field, I think I hear Titan there. I think that is an emulation of what they're looking for. All right, so – do I want to give you one more since you had nine? <laughs> well, I did have bonus. a lot. Do you have a bonus? Well, one of one of my bonus points was I was excited to see Malik Willis get a full game. Um, I, I don't love the circumstances under which it happened, but I think it was really good for him to have an entire game to get comfortable, get in his groove, show the improvements that he has made throughout the offseason and throughout training camp, show how much he's grown. Um, I think we're starting to see him, uh, not starting to see, we are continuing to see him grow and learn and his decision-making. I mean, Mike Vrabel talked about it as well. We are seeing the progression of Malik Willis as a quarterback in the National Football League. And I really enjoyed watching that, and I liked seeing him get his feet under him. You know, it wasn't the start-stop that you get in the preseason, especially with multiple quarterbacks and everything. He got to have a complete game all to himself and really just take the reins and go. And I was excited for him to have that opportunity. Do you think about if he's healthy – giving Will Levis the whole game on Friday. Depending on how healthy Will Levis is. You know, we don't know the extent of what kept him out. Right. Clearly he suited up. He threw before he threw before the game. It certainly seemed more precautionary than it did they're fearful. I think you're 100% right. 
Amy's point is very well taken. It, I liked what he did the first ball game. I'm talking about the head coach, Mike Vrabel, with these two quarterbacks because his, his point was, very, was really well taken because a, a guy that's going to be a backup, you've got to be able to come in. I mean, you've got to be able to start stop. I mean, right. that has to happen. But the way the circumstances were, and what Amy said is right, the thing that I liked about it was Malik Willis didn't flinch. He came right in and, and, and just took it because he knew it was going to be his. Now, look, he is a, he's a work in progress. But those of us that have been around Ascension St. Thomas Sports Park all the time and have watched him all the time, even when it's not open to the public, it's not open to the media, we've seen this progression, you know, starting with the offseason, what he did. So I like the fact that he did that in the game. And the other thing is he had some teachable moments in that game that you can't get unless you've been in the flow of a football game. So I, I'm all about his development. And to me, you've got to give, of course, the coaches get a lot, a lot of the credit, but he gets a major part of the credit. He knew what he didn't know, and he was humble enough to admit it and work on it. He's worked at his craft, and he's still, he's still not completely there. You're never completely there as a quarterback in this league, never, until maybe your 45-year-old Tom Brady. But this guy has done himself a lot of favors in this offseason, and having to play a whole game I think was very good for him. Hey, Titans fans, it's always game on with Duncan, so grab a coffee and kick off the action, whether that's drinking a cup of coffee on your way to the game Friday night or grabbing one to go before watching the game at home. Duncan is always there to help you get your game on. Just like the pros, we need to be at our best come game time, which is why Duncan is the most important part of your game day ritual because it's always the best call for football. America runs on Duncan. Mike Vrabel said on the Mike Vrabel Show, the first one of the season, 6 p.m. Central Time, every Monday night from here until hopefully Valentine's Day. That would be the goal. That would be awesome. That That's would nice. be the goal. He said that because the team is not going to scrimmage the Patriots, they are having a draft. They are having a blue and white scrimmage. Uh, Terrell Williams will coach one team. John Stryker, better known as Stretch, will coach the other team. The draft went all the way down to the trainers. So <laughs> one team will warm up on one field. Warm, one team will warm up on another field. Coach Mack, the decision to hold the blue and white scrimmage, from Mike Vrabel's standpoint, why do this? Competitive. To begin with, it's not just the same routine as a practice. Competitive adds a little juice to it. But again, because New England is not coming here, this gives you we, we saw the value of working against somebody else in a different environment as far as really meaningful snaps every day up there in Minnesota. We saw it. At this point in camp, this will be very, very competitive. And plus, you are you're going to be able to with the draft, you could be able to match people up against people that you you know that you'd like to see them against. It's really a good idea because the thing that happens, and again, training camp is different than it used to be, but still, you want to stay in a routine, but you also want to shock the routine because when you're playing in a ball game, there's a lot of different things that happen that are a shock to the system. I like this a lot. And he's just trying to get a little bit more juice, which he will get out of this last part of training camp. More and more teams, it seems like, are canceling second joint practices. Now, this one was done because New England had the injury at Green Bay. They were scheduled to fly directly here. The Titans had conversations with the Patriots while they were still on the ground getting ready to leave Minnesota, and it was decided that there would not be joint practices. I think at least three others have been canceled. Coach Mack, I'll ask you this first. Are we learning now – in the three preseason game era, that the second joint practice, which seems like a good idea in theory, may be too much? Mike, you and I talked about this earlier, and, and so I'm going to share what we talked about. The, th the two days of work at Minnesota were very beneficial, but you had two head coaches that had control of their teams. You had no fights. You had, you had some jawing back and forth. 
You had, you know, Hang on just a, a couple of swipes. Hang on. No, no, Coach, she's eating a Snickers. She's, uh, she, 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 first Amy of all. Amy Wells first in of the all, middle of no, Coach no, Mack's no, comment. No, 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 it, it, was, it was before it started. Let me say this, Mike. She's eating a Snickers. No, 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 Mike. Before, she looked like a raccoon in a campsite. She was. She took the <laughs> lid off the Snickers jar and was trying to and was trying to sneak it before anybody in the tent saw what she was doing. And then when you were talking, opening this segment, which you're a professional. Thank you, Coach. She was trying. You are. And she was she was unwrapping it like she was unwrapping it, hoping nobody. And I'm sitting here because I can see her. I'm sitting here looking at her like this. And plus the fact, I mean, she was eating. She looked at that thing. I mean, like she she and then she started in on it like she was going to the electric chair. I mean, like it was going to be the last no. meal she ever had. And I wasn't going to say anything because it's not my place. It's not my place. You're the boss of all of this. I'm not. But I, I saw her She's as, as I said, this. as Rocky <laughs> Raccoon that went into the Snickers jar and tried to be as quiet as possible. So I'd look over you giving a <laughs> no, good answer. No, I, I just glanced down. I, 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 I want to well, see look, if she would like to follow your point. Well, no, <laughs> she can't because her mouth's full of Snickers. She I, cannot. I, She's actually weeping now. She's I weeping. was so hungry, and I sat down, and I was like, I can wait till the end of the show. Turns out, I can't. Well, I'll follow what I was saying before the Snickers interrupted. You and I talked about this. You had two very beneficial days in Minnesota. I think we all agree with that. But your two head coaches clearly had laid out how this was going to work. Tremendous work, physical work, worked very hard against one another, but there were no there were no Braveheart fights. Nobody came together. There was no rumbles, and I mean, it was good. Now, the thing that happens, I think we all know this. I've experienced it. I can't count how many times with joint practices in my career. What happens is, is that whichever team gets up on the other one the first day, then the team that got over on is in those meetings that night going, hey, is this who we are? Is this what they're going to think about us? And all of that, and these are competitive alpha dudes out there, so the next day it's going to be even ramped up even more. That's what impressed me so much about our work with Minnesota is we were able to keep it on an even keel with high intensity, high level, but practice football. And to me, I think what's going to start happening is is people will schedule one day, and then the the problem is is when you put everything together it took us it takes that ops crew and everybody to to get there and to schedule two days i mean you have to do it to me i think people will still schedule two days but you need to pick and choose who you work against that's important that and the point too is where we were the facility that they have <laughs> at <laughs> minnesota <laughs> We mentioned last week it's on the old property of Northwest Airlines headquarters. And so it is, I guess, thousands of acres. Has to be. And the hotel is right across the parking lot. Basically, it's a five-minute walk. For the operations crew, that's as good a setup as you'll ever find for a joint practice. And it's still hard. It's still hard to to get the plane and to get everybody up there because you have to take so much stuff. So you won't find a better place to do it than Minnesota. And yet it's still an incredible amount of work and an incredible amount of upheaval for the entire football staff. Well, Arizona was following us in there. And right. I think people around the league, if they've ever been up there, I was taken aback by how good that facility is. I'd never seen it before, the practice facility. Been in the stadium before, but I've never seen the practice facility. It's you could not be more ideal. And as you said, to host another team, it was seamless. It, it, it was it was not only seamless. I mean, it seems like all of the support people that they had there at Minnesota to help our support people. There was a gang of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was an army of people. Outstanding out job. It, it, it really was, and so. Minnesota will have people wanting to come there if they're going to play there. And when you got two, you know, two at home, two away on alternating years. But uh, for us, for us, I'm glad we were able to get those two days in with, with that place because I'm like you, Mike. I've seen a lot of facilities in this league. That one was like, okay. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, the other thing, too, Rhett, let's talk about U.S. Bank Stadium and let's talk about that roof. And let's think about the roof we're going to have at the new Titans Stadium, which is going to be the same thing. And the way it felt, you know, when we got there in the afternoon 
and the sun's still shining and it it you know it feels like you're outside mm-hmm. it's yeah, phenomenal it, it totally did and because uh the same architecture firm that built that is going to be building the new titan stadium when we had the opportunity brad willis and, and philip noel and i had an opportunity to go over uh pretty early on on friday afternoon to set up equipment in the booth and we kind of just took notes and looked at a lot of things with that in mind mm-hmm. and thinking about the possibilities what that east bank's going to look like in a few years you know not that far down the road uh, it's an impressive building like the design like what they th- did with it uh, the amenities involved but you're right with that roof the way that it is it is just like it's outdoors it's just a it, in this case uh, at that place it's a glass filter more or less, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Although it's some sort of high-level plastic. Mm-hmm. Didn't you have the na- you had the name? I had of the it. name, and I can't I can't say it properly. But it's the new thing, and you can open the doors too, just like at SoFi, and just like at US Bank. Apparently, I think uh, I don't know if Allegiant is exactly like it. The roof is, but you can open the doors and get the airflow. And yet Saturday, they chose not to because it was stifling heat. Because it was so hot outside. Yeah, because it's so mm-hmm. hot outside. So you got to be in a nice indoor situation, which I think everybody's like, retractable roof, a, a dome. It's like, no, those things aren't there anymore. This is what you're going for, and this is what the new stadium is going to have. Well, and that's we've played in stadiums like that and being down on the field throughout those games at SoFi, at U.S. Bank. There, you forget that you're indoors, it really is because of the sunlight, because of the crosswind that you can have. I mean, the first time I ever went to SoFi, I was not dressed properly because I dressed like we were going to Houston, where Houston is very much, uh, they have a retractable kind of situation, but they, I mean, when we were there, they're never using it. So it's always, you feel like you're playing in a box indoors. Well, un- unless it's during COVID. <laughs> unless it's during COVID. And they, in and which they put case. us on the other side of the stadium and decided to open the roof <laughs> yeah. for that game. And then at the end of the first half, we have the sun shining directly in our eyes. Yeah, I forgot about that. And then in the second <laughs> half, we're in total darkness over there. Mm-hmm. That was. That was not great. That was not great. Not well, ideal. But it, it's like playing in a climate control box there. Right. This is not going to be that experience because it really feels like you're outside. You just don't get rained on, which is awesome. Well, and, and you know, there was a lot of discussion when the news of the new stadium came about and the renderings and all these things about a retractable roof and, and why not. And, and Titan CEO and President Burke Nihill and I had a conversation about that, and he explained it well here on the OTP about, you know, it's like having a, a really expensive, nice car that, you know, it's got a, a, a nice giant sunroof that you just never use. You just, Maybe you're not a sunroof person, but in this case, you know, Houston is a prime example. In the 20-plus years that Mike and I have been going down there doing Titans radio games, I can count on one hand with fingers left over how many times that roof's been open. And one of those is because there was remnants of a hurricane that come through and it removed and ripped the panels off of it. Yeah. So it wasn't even a choice. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a weather thing by force in this case. Mm-hmm. And so I think Burke's numbers were three or four percent of the time you would actually use it and, and open it. And for what the cost is a be? mega bucks oh. addition to already an you know a handsome bottom line in this thing well i mean how many times have we gone to indianapolis where every week the conversation is open or closed roof open or closed i i mean i worked for that team for a year and then have played against them for a decade and i can probably count on one maybe two hands how many times that roof was ever open yep. and that's their big selling point oh mr ursay loves roof can to play be open. that game doesn't he yeah but hardly ever is it open yeah hardly ever except that one day in uh, 20 when it's well, about he was trying to outside. play freeze out and they still was lost the game was it 19 or 20 2019 or it was 19 2019 where he decided to open the roof much to the chagrin of the fans and his own like equipment staff they didn't didn't even have the proper gear and Uh the officials didn't have the proper gear yes (laughs) and ended up having to borrow it from 
the, the Tennessee, Tennessee Titans. Titans. <laughs> Whatever you need, guys. What Here you go. As Our warmest history. coats. <laughs> as we talk about stadium, visit TitansNewStadium.com to take a look at what's going on with the new stadium or to place a deposit for your PSL or get higher on the priority list by becoming a season ticket member today. As a matter of fact, if you buy a 2023 Titans season ticket, which you have to get a PSL, yes. that PSL amount will be credited toward the new stadium. So you not only get tickets for this year, but you get in line for the future. 615-565-4200. 615-565-4200 to get involved in that. Tear Tart. You mentioned Tear Tart a moment ago getting in a fight at the at the practice. He did throw a punch. One swing. One swing. Um, <laughs> Max sounds like me. Then he, goes <laughs> out, then he goes out and is dominant in the game. He also had a viral moment during a practice where he, how, how would you term that? Where he hip tossed the guy or? Hump move. Hump move. Reggie Wait. White hump move. Yes, uh, but he did. Is he, that the technical term? Yes. It is. He threw him. I mean, he threw this guy out of the way, and well, it's, a, it's a big man. What is Tier Tart right now? Where is Tier Tart right now? What, how do you summarize how he fits on this football team and what he's trying to be and what he can be? Let's start where Tier Tart started from when he came here. First of all, I mean, he had a pretty, he had some stops in college before he got to where he finally ended up. He comes in here and is as raw as meat. I mean, he is raw, raw, raw. I mean, we had, I won't go into it, but had some illustrious media guru who said he couldn't play because he couldn't hit a sled. We'll go past that. When you start to, de when you start developing him, and start to look at him. This is a big body dude that's got some twitch to him. The issue with him, his entire career, I would assume, is his endurance. Because this is a big, thick man. Now, he's worked on his body. He has worked on that. And the other thing that I think has really helped him, he can play a shade, which is between the center and the guard, to Jeffrey Simmons' three technique. Because now people are so worried about Jeffrey Simmons as a three, the better Tier Tart works, he's going to see more single blocks. This this guy has has with Coach uh, Coach T has done a great job with him. Because, Terrell Williams. Yes, he was patient. He was forceful with him, and then Mike Vrabel has been very good with him too. And Mike Vrabel has been very honest with him. We need you to be able to up your conditioning so that you can play more than 15 or 18 snaps a game because we need you in there. I think we're seeing the development of a guy that he's a perfect shade technique, which, again, is between the center of the guard, away from the three technique, which is on the outside shoulder of the guard, on the other side. But he's a guy that people have to pay attention to now. That hip toss, that was Bradbury, by the way, a number one pick as a center. The hip toss that he made there, you don't hip toss people, first of all, unless you understand what you're doing. You're a vol for life. You saw Reggie White do it. I just, did. Just because Reggie White was Reggie White. It's not an easy thing to do. I mean, they're, they're, and to me, we're only going to see him blossom more and more. I like the player because the other thing about him is he's got a little bit of stuff in his neck, too. And that's what you want from those guys up there. But the progression that he's made since he has come here due to the coaching and also due to his realization that I've got a chance here. I've got people here that are investing in me, so I'm going to invest in myself. I mean, he came in here just a big guy, but now he's become more than that. And I really like what he's done. He is uh, trying to go from being just the run stuffer to the complete player. Yes, and I mean, and he's never going to be a silky smooth guy, but silky smooth guys is not what you need a lot up there. We've got one. We've got, a, we've got an anomaly. We've got a bear on two legs over there, Jeffrey Simmons. But this guy's a great, great compliment, but he's improved himself as a football player. He wasn't content with what he was. He's improving himself. Who else is showing in the defensive line, Rhett? Uh, so... Honestly, if is if I'm looking at the whole thing, I, I'm I've been watching Sam Okawanu in year two, 
and seeing the steps he's trying to make forward in this. Now, he's a big, thick guy mm -hmm. and rocked up. Now, he, he's, he's different from the T.R. Tart we just mentioned. Uh, I've been watching him as we get closer to the end of this thing and, and heading into the regular season because he's a guy that wants to make this roster. Jaden Peavy is another and a guy who has transformed his body in a way. And you're talking about a mammoth human, human being in, in Jaden Peavy. He, I remember seeing him coming in here last year. I'm like, I thought he was a tackle or something. He was so big. Well, there was, there was a time they were going to look at him potentially as an offensive yeah. tackle because his arms are so long that he really fits that. I mean, you're saying, oh, my goodness. And there are a lot of defensive linemen who become very good. Off at, you know, tight ends and defensive linemen mm -hmm. oftentimes become very good offensive tackles. Is he a five technique, as you call it, if, he, if he's doing what he does well? Yes, because you link. A five technique someone that lines up on the outside shoulder of an offensive tackle in a 3-4 in a defense cause when you've got an outside backer outside of him, but his length. Any t the further away that you move from the ball, you know, the length becomes big, a little bit more because the long arm stuff to shorten where you're getting into the cylinder becomes important. But, yes, that's what he is. Uh, he's a good-looking player. The other, the other guy that I'm watching, and, and you know, th he's not necessarily on the defensive line, but he's a pass rusher, and it's a young man who's really started making plays in these first two preseason <laughs> games in Caleb Murphy, the undrafted uh, free agent from Ferris State. And that's another guy like Tajay Spears I kept talking to Coach Mack about. I'm like, this guy's from Ferris State, and he's getting invited to the combine. That tells me somebody sees something. Now – can he use some functional play strength in those things? Yes, but that that's what Ascension St. Thomas Sports Park and Frank Perino and Todd Torricelli and all these guys, that's what they're the, there for the is question, to get that You stuff. want to say something about him? Well, no, it was just – Rhett just read that right out of my brain because I was thinking, someone talk about Caleb Murphy. Somebody say it, and you said it. But the question for a Caleb Murphy, though, Coach, is as you try to put together a 53 to go to New Orleans, where does he fit? Well, and, those, and that's the trick with several of these guys that many of us are excited about. You know, the defensive backs and all of the running backs. It's like you can't keep them all. No. And you've got to put together the 53 that is the most functional. You know, how do you do it? That's the Jenga puzzle yeah. of putting together an initial 53. An initial 53. And the other thing that you got to think is this. If you don't put him on the 53 will uh, 31 was is somebody in the 31 willing to take him and put him on their 53 right because when you claim somebody off waivers this you have to put them on your 53 mm -hmm. you can't claim them to put them on your practice squad this guy to me and then needs to do exactly what rashad weaver did this offseason marry yourself to the iron he needs to get married because rashad weaver has transformed his game with functional strength Rhett's 100 percent right he needs more nfl functional strength he doesn't have an nfl body yet he's got an, a frame that can grow into an nfl body once he gets with frank perino and once he gets with the nutrition system but he's got a little something to him because he can separate and get to the quarterback and that, those guys are hard to find to your question is you you, you make two decisions who do we bump if we keep him on a 53, or do we take the chance that somebody else of the other 31 will put him on their 53? Sure. Yeah, and I'm afraid if you put him on the practice squad, that will come to pass. I think there's enough. Well, you've got to wave him. You've got to wave him yeah. first. You've got to wave the, yeah, him the, on the 29th. That's right. A yeah. week, week from Tuesday. That's right. That, that's a different move. And then you've got to get him through because if he's a waiver claim by somebody, mm -hmm. uh, he, you know, then, then that becomes a thing. And if he clears waivers, then you can sign him to the practice squad. And we've seen this over the years. LeGarrette Blunt, Jack Doyle. <sighs> there have been other guys. And people say, well, why did they do that? That was so – that the LeGarrette Blunt, that was so – well, it's like, yeah, the LeGarrette Blunt thing is because we didn't have enough linebackers. Any linebackers. You needed a spot. And we needed numbers and it just, in a position. And the Jack Doyle thing is they needed a spot, and you're trying desperately to get right. to that 53 and, and be ready to play week one. You're, 
you'd like to think about 2024. You'd like to think about later in the season. You'd like to think about development. But the first roster is about beating New Orleans. You're, you're 100% right. And, and there's a, so much that goes into it. And, you know, we all know it. I've lived it for a lot of years. Is those decisions sometimes come down to a feel as to what they're doing, but sometimes it's out of necessity. Mm -hmm. And you're right with look, Garrett Blunt. I was here for that one. I mean, that was a hard, hard thing to do because, you know, we had taken Garrett Blunt as a free agent when nobody else would touch him. Get near him. When nobody would touch him. Jeff Fisher said, I can handle him, and he could. But so those are decisions. It's not because you didn't like the player. It's not because they didn't like Jack Doyle. Uh, they needed some other positions at the moment. And that's that or the those are the decisions that personnel people and coaches really agonize over, I promise you, going into this cut. Well, and then the agony too with Theo Jackson being put on the practice squad last year. Minnesota comes after Theo Jackson. The Titans are desperate to keep him, but they don't have a roster spot. Don't have a spot. Yep. I mean yep. and so Theo signs with Minnesota. He's doing very well. Now Minnesota they got a bunch of safeties. We'll see if hopefully things will work out well for Theo. But, you know, if you're the player, you've got a chance to go get on an active roster. He didn't really want to leave here. His dream was to play for the Titans. But you've, you've got to have that availability or you say, well, you know, we're carrying an extra receiver. Maybe we can dump in a receiver and, and call him up to the active roster so he won't leave. And then sometimes you can't. And with the injuries that the Titans have had the last two years – They've lost some good players at different points that could have helped them later in the year because they had injuries and necessity at that moment. Well, that's 100% right. And from a coaching aspect of it and from an organization aspect of it, if a guy gets a chance to sign on an active roster when he's on your practice squad and you've developed him, I mean, you can't blame them. They have to go because their, their time to make money is short. And the difference between an, uh, an active roster check, even the minimum, and a practice squad check, I'm not real good at math, but it's a lot. <laughs> well, and then you start earning that time toward your pension. Right. All of that. To become, you know, getting a year closer to being a vested veteran, free agency, but also, hey, that pension is a big deal for, for any player. I remember we re-signed a player one year for the last two games, and that got him to his pension level. And he was thrilled i mean it was chris it was literally christmas time and but to him he knew financially what that was going to mean for him later in life and that's real that's real life there mm -hmm. it's three games it's three years three games that's right three years three games and uh you, you don't begrudge any of them trying to get that while they're trying to play good ball breaking news titans fans you're going to want to hear this it's official seat geek is now the official ticketing partner of the tennessee titans that's right, the deal is finalized, and SeatGeek is the newest member of the Titans family. <laughs> Mike. I don't know. I Mike, haven't done Mike, anything. Mike, Mike, let me tell you. If I... you haven't heard the name yet, get used to it, because you'll be hearing it a lot this season. Whether you're buying or selling tickets to Titans games or any other live event in Nashville, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek, the new official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. So Titans fans can fan. You're listening to... <laughs> <laughs> the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. Farm Bureau Health Plans is celebrating 76 years of providing Tennesseans with high-quality health coverage at an affordable rate. Visit FBHP.com to learn about their history in Tennessee. Are you going to eat more of this? No, let me tell you what she was doing. She looked like Weller, her dog. <laughs> Major Molly, your dog's looking at a ham bone on the, on the floor. <laughs> she was, while you were talking, she was doing like this. <laughs> I was... You were considering going I'm, after them? She was side-eyeing that, that. Look, I'm going to get her off the hook here. Because All I wanted. Mars Chocolate is an official partner of the Tennessee Titans. And as it says here on the label, all she's trying to do during this OTP is keep from making rookie mistakes. Does anybody know yeah. why it's named Snickers? No, why? No. Anybody know? Do you know? Absolutely. Oh, why? The Mars family that started it. Yeah. Okay. Mars Bar, clearly, was sure. the first one. Right. It's that. Mars. Yeah. They also owned horses. Their favorite horse was named Snicker. 
No kidding. Really? Snicker died, and so when they came out with this one, they named it Snicker. To honor after the horse. It's named after the horse. Oh, Are you nice. like family friends with the Mars family? Be honest. I just know stuff. I feel like this would I be know, like, well, I, yeah, they were our neighbors. Yeah, in I know Texas. important stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's very good. That is good. <laughs> well, that was a nice little nugget. That's why or they named nougat. it Snickers. <laughs> nougat. Snickers was the name of the horse. That's tremendous. That's good. How many roster spots are literally still up for grabs, Dave McGinnis? Four. 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 On on average, you say four per team, probably? Yes. So some teams three, some teams six, but it would average out to four. Three to six normally is what it is. I think four on this football team because of injury. And also, there are a lot of times, and you talk about roster decisions, there are a lot of times where, you know, you, you've got decision between a vet and a first-year guy, and maybe that vet <coughs> is – and the first year guy's coming on, but maybe that vet won't get picked up by somebody and you don't have to guarantee a contract for the entire year. If you sign him in week two. After the first week, all of those things filter in. And so I've been involved in a lot of roster setups, and so a lot of all those things fit in. But normally it's three to six. The better team you have, and here's the other thing too. Just like we worked out against Minnesota, this personnel group, that was up there with us, the personnel department, they were scouting the Vikings really hard at every practice. They were really scouting them. And so you're always looking for somebody. There's somebody that is somewhere that you may have had an eye on during the draft or you may have an eye on during free agency period that somebody else got that is teetering on the edge of somewhere else. So it's not just necessarily who you've got here that you're looking at. It's who you're looking at league-wide too. All right, let's put Rep Bryant on the spot. Practice squad spot, 16. How many of those guys do you think for the Titans are here right now? What's your number? You don't have to name them, but just your number. I'm going to say at least a dozen of them. Amy? Yeah, I was going to say 10 to 12. 10. I think that's right. 10. I think there's a goodly number here. Some years it's been you just wipe the slate clean and go get 16 guys other yeah. places. I mean, that it's a good roster. The other point about the practice squad is we all know that, I mean, when they first started, it was five. Right. Mm-hmm. And it was also five with the caveat that they had to have two years experience or less. So that cut your number way down. Now you've got 16, which clearly the math is more, but you've got six spots that you can have veteran players on there too, you know, and, and pay them incrementally more than you pay, you know, the first. So it, putting together the practice squad, that's changed a lot for personnel departments and coaches too. So I think 10 though, I think we've got, 10 guys here that they'd probably like to continue to develop. And then that leaves you six somewhere else. Three quarterbacks on this roster? Yes. I believe so. Yep. Yes. I don't have any doubt about it right now. None. Nope. No doubt. But no that, doubt. But that means a roster spot has to come from somewhere else. That's more, correct. More than likely on the offense. Yeah. So do it, you do, it do, might be a running back. You think so? I think so. Really? I mean, just – uh, off a jump. Huh. What what position were you thinking, Amy? Um, maybe a receiver. Maybe. I'm thinking tight end. See? Okay, that was my that was my gut and I mm-hmm. I'm thinking tight gut. end because I think tight end is a place where you could carry two guys on the practice squad as tight ends because you think about the the other strategy in practice squad that is not discussed enough is it's for practice. And your tight ends are guys who can run scout team on offense or defense. And you need to get, you know, the look teams have to do that. And it's like Coach Vrabel was talking about Mason Kenzie. Mason Kenzie has been a very valuable practice squad player because he can practice on offense or defense to help the team get ready. So the only thing about tight ends to me, especially with what Tim Kelly's doing now, it looks like it's going to be a multiple tight end offense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they, they've shown it already in preseason, so I'm not giving anything away. No. But we see in practice, you've seen a lot of them in the backfield too. And you've seen a lot of I mean, moving in the backfield. You know, So it's going to be interesting to see. But you could always call that player up on the weekend too. You can do that. You've got so many moves you can make. You can, you can do that. And you've got some guys who have – 
the kind of experience that you could call them up in a heartbeat and, and do it. Wesco is an interesting player because I think he's probably the best blocking tight end naturally they've had in how long, Red? A while. Yeah. Craig Stevens, maybe? Cat Ooh. Stevens was the best blocking tight end okay. when I was here. Okay. Cat Stevens was really good as a blocker. Yeah. Really good. I don't know if they've had anybody that good since then. As a blocking tight end? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I've missed a few years when I was gone at another team, but. West Coast, didn't miss no. much. West yeah. Coast pretty good. Uh, obviously, you've got a Conquo. Um, I think Wiley is coming on, and you're going to start to see more of him. Is there a fourth? You know, does a Raider make it? Odekoya is a guy that has been talked about as well, uh, who has obviously improved his blocking dramatically. But with some of the ways that those guys will be used, I think we're going to see them more in receiving roles than maybe we've seen in blocking roles in the past just because of what Tim Kelly likes to do. Uh, And so then maybe you can take a receiver spot and then there's your quarterback because you can utilize the tight ends in so many different ways but than I what think, we've been doing. I think you're going to have five active receivers on game day. Absolutely. Yeah. Because I think yeah. Mo- Moore is going to play special teams, and obviously Westbrook Akine is going to play special that's teams. The, that's the yeah. key. That's the key yeah. with running back and tight end and receiver. Who is your legitimate core four special teams player? Right. Yeah. That's, the, that's, the, that's the case for all of this. Because a lot of teams just keep four receivers active on game day because they need a player at another position to play special teams. The Titans are different in that they're going to have five guys. And, I mean, obviously Hopkins is not playing special teams. No. Burks is not playing special teams. So you've got teams. three. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Phillips may be as a punt returner. You know, but other, otherwise you, you need you yeah. need because Craig Arkerman needs core teamers, and that's what you know. We talked about it during the broadcast of why they're returning all of those kickoffs that are five and six yards deep because they're trying to find somebody that can block in space because that's the hardest thing to do. Blocking in space on a kickoff return is the hardest thing to teach because none of them have ever done it before, and plus they're still people are running 35 yards at them full speed and they've got to come to balance and also be able to shield them and get them at least past the break point of the return so they're trying to find those dudes by the way i was just i was trying to just check the time here and i've gotten a message from colin allred your former linebacker senator colin allred running for senator running for senator colin what do you think about that really that one of your guys one of your dudes is in congress you remember how smart he was oh yeah he was a he went to Baylor. He was a smart, smart dude, and always you could tell that that Colin, there was, he was going to do something else besides this. Yeah, I mean you you always knew. I mean I've you know when he's he yeah, he's running for that Senate seat in Texas, and uh, I hope he gets it. But you're proud of those guys. I well, mean, of course, you've, coach. You've got, I mean, look, you've got it, coaches, you've got business owners, you've got a congressman who's running for Senate. I mean, it's well. First of all, when he came in here, he had no guarantees to make anything of this team we talked about we, we talked about dr gibby he had a smart guy could get lined up was willing to do whatever it took special teams and whatever and every time because you have daily meetings during this coaches and personnel people okay give me your give me your four give me your five give me your four give me your five give me your six give me your definite gone draw the line you all you're going to hear that all the time in these personnel meetings draw a line for me Draw a line for me, Amy, on the on the on the receiver. Draw a line. Where's the line? You're always fighting as a coach. If you're in the room with them and you and you have, they have something intrinsically to them, you're always fighting to keep him above that line as long as you can. And as long as they do their part, then sometimes you end up with the Colin Allred stories. He fought for four years. Four years to make the football team. Four years, and he made it every time. Mm-hmm. But he he earned above that line. And when you earn above that line, uh, I hope he wins that Senate seat. Then I'll have some pull in the state house <laughs> <laughs> in Austin. There it is. Well, but, I, I mean, that, that just goes to tell you, I mean, anybody who fights it, well, like what Kenzie's doing right now, when, when you have guys who, who fight for it for that period of time, uh, there's a level of respect for them as human beings. Like we told the story the other night on Titans Radio about Kenzie being the emergency quarterback. 
And so I went down in pregame, and he's running some pass routes, and I pulled him aside. I said, Mason, I said, when's the last time you played quarterback? He said, eighth grade. <laughs> Good. And I said, really? He goes, yeah. He goes, I went out for quarterback. We ran the triple option, and I went out for quarterback, and I got beat out. I said, so did you play some quarterback after that? He goes, nope. <laughs> <laughs> none, none times yeah none Thanks. times and so so Great. then i said okay Good. um i said if we have to i said if you have to go in at quarterback tonight against the vikings how many plays can you run he said all of them <laughs> <laughs> i went to the walkthrough and, and watched it you know the, the walkthrough that they had when they put him in and i went Okay, I had no idea about the eighth grade. Eighth grade. I'm, I'm thinking back to the eighth grade when I was in Snyder, Texas, Travis Junior High Blue Devils. I can't even remember <laughs> what was going on then, but for him to pop that out with you. And you know what? When they put him in there to run those, those RPOs, he did it. He looked pretty yeah. good. Well, it worked. Yeah. I mean, it worked. Yeah. So That's awesome. Let me tell you something else, too. Okay, That good. just shows you this head coach and this coaching staff – they're not afraid to try anything. Let's go back to that Houston game way long time ago when we had nobody left, and they put the King Cat in. And 2018, won, week won, two. Won the game with the King Cat with a depleted offensive line. With I mean, just, And they walked through it and put it in on a Saturday morning in the bubble. Shut the bubble. Nobody else is in there. This coaching staff knows what they're doing. That was Matt LaFleur. I mean, and Mike Vrabel. No left tackle, no right tackle, no Delaney Walker, no Marcus Mariota. But you had the King Pretty Cat. Pretty wild. It wasn't mm-hmm. great. As Mike has named it the King Cat, and it worked. Yeah, Mike that, Vrabel's second game as head coach. The best passer that day was Kevin Byard. Yeah. 66-yarder to Dane Crookshank. A, a, a two-yard throw and 64 yards later. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he left-handed it out there. It was Ooh, scared that, me to death. I'm like, oh, gosh, he's going to throw this ball. And I think we all appreciated it. You know, and as a former coach, you look at that and you go, now that's the ball coach. When you've got nothing and you make something of it, and not only make something of it, you want a division game with it. Big yep. one. Big one. That's what I think is so cool about this blue and white scrimmage in the last week uh, of training camp, to your point about, getting guys re-energized and making it through that last stretch before you have to make difficult roster decisions and and the regular season comes. What a cool concept and idea that, you know, Coach Terrell Williams, who's already coached a preseason game, is going to be on one side. John Stryker, Stretch, his right-hand man is going to do the other. He's already coached a game too, by the way. He absolutely has. And then I'm fascinated to know what the draft order was. How high a draft pick was John Takahashi or <laughs> Joey Barranco or Matt Thompson? You're talking about members of the staff. Yeah. The OT people it went might not the, know. Yeah. They went down through all of those things. I love it. I think it's a great idea. It, what a way to end a long training camp. It you doesn't know? surprise any of us, and it should pr- surprise none of the OTP listeners, the OT people, that Mike Vrabel thinks outside the box. Yeah. Well, he tries to keep it interesting for guys, too. He tries to keep people engaged. He tries to use, the, use every minute to get better in a way, but understanding the monotony of what this can become, if you let it. If you let it. And he does not let it become monotonous. Well, it, it just, he just gets it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he gets the National Football League on a lot of levels. A lot of levels. Well, because when guys are engaged and they're excited about what they're doing, you're able to make more progress. Sure. You're able to continue to work on things. It's like teaching babies different skills. If you teach them a song and a game, they're engaged with it. Mm-hmm. And so then the skills come with it. It's a sa- uh, not to say that the Tennessee Titans players are babies, but... Your point is... I get yeah, your point. Uh, the Titans are hooked because, on phonics. Yes. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> Math is fun. Um, no, but because they are engaged, because there's an excitement to it, because there's a competitive aspect to it, it's not the same rote schedule day after day of meetings, practice, meetings, walkthrough, meetings. Well, because coaches will tell you the last thing you want in this period of time is i mean i remember just two a days from high school and just trying to survive Mm -hmm. and uh, all you were trying to do is just not die 
I mean, you were just trying to you were just trying to make it through. You can't do that in the NFL. You can't you can't have that mindset. You've got to get better every single day. You've got to keep it competitive every single day because time is so precious with evaluating Eric Guerrero or looking at something offensively or figuring out who's the right, right tackle for the first six games. I mean, these are answers that if we look back in eight months and it's been a good year, then we'll say, man, did they come up with the right answers in those moments in August? That's so true. I mean, you, you've got to have the right answers and the correct decision at the right time because there's always those moments where it could come up. I mean, as I said, this head coach, Mike Vrabel, gets it. You want to eat the rest of your Snickers now? Yeah, Go I ahead. really do. Go ahead. I'm really All hungry. right, for making a rookie mistake. I'm really hungry. That's going to do it for the rest of the OTP for Coach Dave McGinnis and Rhett Bryan and Amy Wells, who's having a Snickers. I'm Mike Keith. Thanks for joining us for the OTP. Mm.